issue. So bear with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on the web page right now. I'm just waiting. It says six people waiting. Hi, John. Thank you for fixing Hi, this. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, we're on yeah, there, we're... but but it's not the right one. Oh. It's not the right link. Hmm. Hi, guys. So I'm very to happy to report that my computer is working again. Thanks. Okay, Great. Good. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. It's always good to be started. So, um, Nico, could you post the new YouTube link under the old events so that when people go to that YouTube link, they're not lost, so to say? Yeah, I would rather not do that, though, and just go for the old link. But I mean, in that case, I just do this. But, but we haven't managed or, or did you fix it? Sorry, I might have missed that. No, no, we didn't fix it. Uh, we I'm, I'm actually live streaming here right now um, and I'm logged in here. So, yeah, I mean, let's just go for it. This is live as we speak. Yeah, I don't see myself. I'm putting my video on. Nicho, can you make me the co-host? Yeah. Thank you. And also Leonor. Thank you. And hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited for today's episode. Thank you so much for all the contributions you've sent. Um, we're really excited for today. If you have any questions before we start, please go ahead. Okay, perfect. So I think the only thing to remember in that case would be to, um, when you're speaking, turn on your camera. When you're not speaking, feel free to turn it off. And of course, unmute yourself when you're speaking and mute yourself when you're not speaking. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so I just shared uh, with all of the panelists the link to the new live stream. Uh, so we have a new link. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna share it on Trello and then uh, we'll go on uh, social media live uh, in, uh, I'd say one minute. And it's on the old YouTube link as well, right? No, on the new one, which I just shared with you guys. Yeah. Also, oh, no. I guess on the old YouTube, I'll make a comment that it's changed. Yeah. I will. Uh, I will just delete it. It's just, Nico, that we shared this quite widely. So I'm just worried that people will think it's not happening at all. So just create, just put a comment in that um, link and say that yeah. it's been changed. Yeah. I'll do it now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn off my video. I don't want to be seen. <clears throat> Aloha. Come on, Ajin. Kia ora. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Ora. Welcome. So just a little note to the to all of our panelists, we do have a chat here that's just accessible to um, us as panelists. So if you if anything comes up, you want to drop us a note, please feel free to use that. You just want to make sure that it's going to all it's all panelists and not to um, panelists and attendees. And if I'll try to keep keep track of the timing, if we're I'll give little a little hints along the way if we're on time or if we're a little bit behind time. Um, I'll try to drop a note into the chat. And um, Victor, I think you're in touch with John. Do you know if he'll be able to join us today? Uh, I haven't been in touch with him this morning. Okay, but. Um, great. So just in case he's not, um, he, Carson, I see that you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you mind replacing John if he's not here? Hello. Hello. Hi. Is this, um, uh, all right. So hello, everyone. This is Carson. I wasn't really ready. So because as of last night, I think everyone was in. Well, of course, as as promised, I can wear the the, the team's jersey just in case someone is not in. No, but it's um if you don't have anything prepared, then don't worry. We'll just if John doesn't come, we'll just leave we'll just leave that part out. It's just that I would need to let Jay Athma know um with enough time ahead so she doesn't mention him. Um, okay. 
Okay, thank you, Carson. Thank you. So, so this is Jeff. J just from the conversation here, I'm, I'm. If I'm going to send out a social media message, I should change the, uh, the, um, address, on it. The YouTube link to the one that was sent in the chat, exactly. Okay. Yes. Let me send you a um, draft tweet right now for a live now, so that uh, you have everything yes. you need. On it. The YouTube link to the one that was sent in the chat, exactly. Okay. Yes. Let me send you a. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Hi Jay. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Uh, Jack, uh, if one of our panelists, John, doesn't show up, would would you be prepared to talk for four minutes on mental health from your context? Um, yeah, if John doesn't rock up, happy to. Awesome, Jack, saving the team. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> OK, so I will change John's name to Jack Collard. Jack, could you just quickly tell Jayathma, or I can change it, Jay, and send it to you again, just, or maybe type it. Oh, we have, we have John now. Ah, OK. <laughs> oh, awesome. Perfect. Hi, John. Hi, hi. Hi, go oh, good morning. You. <laughs> hi, to. Hi, everyone. So just a reminder also to our panelists, when um, you have the option to turn on your own video, if I don't see that you come on, I'll give you a little nudge here to turn on your video. You'll get a little message from me and then you can accept and your video will come on. After your segment, if you could shut off your video, that would be great. And then, Jayathma, I'll just also let you know, there was an issue connecting to the pre-created YouTube event. So we're mm -hmm. going to stream it to another address. We've posted that address under the event so that people know where to go. And we're going to take the new address for the live now tweets. So just that you know that. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the hour, 8 a.m. Shall we, um, shall we launch? If we had a change of the link, then do you want to give it a few minutes? Yeah. Like maybe a minute or two? Yeah, so yeah. People can figure it out. Good idea. Jay, is it okay if we, I'll share the, I'll flash the flyer just for about like 10 or 15 seconds. And as usual, I'll just welcome, hand over to you. Thank you. Yes, sounds great.
I'm ready whenever you are, Jen. Okay. Okay, everyone. Um, we're going to go live now. We're going to start broadcasting. Good luck. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful session. Hello and welcome to the Coping with COVID webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Over to you, Jayathma. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. I hope that you are safe and you are well and you are taking care of both your physical and mental health and those who are around you. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special episode of our ongoing Coping with COVID webinar series on young people's mental health under the COVID-19 pandemic organized together with my office, WHO and UNICEF. Thank you to also all of you who have been sharing this journey with us since its inception on the 1st of April this year. Today's session, we will look at how the pandemic and government responses to it have affected the mental health of young indigenous people from around the world. And this was developed in close collaboration with the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and the Harvard Medical School COVID-19 Student Response Team. So a big thank you to the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and the Harvard Medical School COVID-19 Student Response Team for their valuable time and uh, inputs as well. Indigenous communities have long been facing particular challenges in accessing affordable, quality mental health care, an issue that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. They also face an issue in how applicable and often individual focused Western approach to mental health is to their communities, where priority is given to connections and interrelationship with others as the basis of psychological well-being. To tell us more about this, we have a fantastic group of young Indigenous people, experts and mental health professionals joining us today. Our webinar will be divided today into five segments. First, we will open today's session with a traditional opening prayer. We will then meet a group of young people from Suriname, Kenya, Bangladesh, the United States, and New Zealand, who will share with us their personal mental health journeys and experiences. In our third segment, we will hear from young Indigenous people around the world on actions they have been taking to educate themselves and to help one another during this pandemic. We will then hear from three mental health experts on some of the most pressing questions that you have been sending us in the past few days. And we'll be sure to get you some good answers for those questions. So stay tuned for the fourth segment. And finally, we will be wrapping up with a closing prayer from Joan from the Samburu community in Kenya. I also look forward to hearing all of your stories in the audience today, so feel free to type in your questions, your comments, and most importantly, your experiences and your feedback with our Coping with COVID journey in the comment boxes. We also have closed captioning available. You can see the link to closed captioning in the chat boxes and in the social media messages should you wish to access that as well. Thank you once again for joining us today. And as I have said before, and I mean from the bottom of my heart, I'm so glad to see you all here. We are all in this together. And I'm glad that we have one another to talk about some of these topics, which we might sometimes not have otherwise spoken about. Now, let's get started because we have a busy journey in the next one hour. It's my pleasure to first introduce Josiah Tuala Mali, a New Zealand-born Samoan who is the co-founder of the Pacific Youth Leadership Transformation Council. Josiah, over to you for our opening prayer. Hello, for love, everyone. Um, let's, I'm just going to acknowledge the people whose land I'm on and then pray. So, 
E te atua nau te kororea te mana whenua o tene rohi tēnā koe e hunga mate ki te hunga mate. Haere, haere, haere. Te hunga ora, ke tātou te hunga ora. So, uh, kia ora te Ngāti Toa, that's the whenua, the land that I'm on, that's the Indigenous people of where I am. And so, um, and acknowledging them, I'd like to give this karakia for us all in our time together. E te atua, ho mai ki a mātou, tō rangamārie, tō aroha, tō kaha. Tomaromatanga mo tenera amine. Give us peace, love, strength, understanding for this day. Amen. Thank you so much, Josiah. What a beautiful way to start our session together. I would also now like to ask you, Josiah, now that we have you on the screen, um, you have been so vocal about mental health challenges and particularly about those which are facing Indigenous young people. Tell us a little bit about your personal experience. How have you been experiencing this pandemic as a whole and what impact has it has on uh, your mental health and how have you coped with it so far? Well, as you said, Jay, um, I'm a New Zealand-born Samoan, so I didn't grow up on my Indigenous land um, when I was young, so um, that's had a big part of me, well, it's had a big impact on my whole life. Um, I have a different experience, like many of those who are in the diaspora, you know, we we straddle two different cultures, two different worlds maybe, and um, and we might not have lived in our Indigenous homeland, and that's, um, and that's something that's so that this affected me differently, but for the Samoan young people who couldn't get back to Samoa, so there are many who are trapped all around the world or who are here in Aotearoa in New Zealand and want to be in there on their Indigenous soil, you know, rooted and, and well in the space because when you're on that physical, you're in that physical connection to the land, um, you, it helps with your wellness. So when you're, when you're not there, that's really hard. But for me, for those of us who, have grown up somewhere else, but we still have the island in our minds and in our hearts through the language, the culture, the stories, and the heritage. That's been what we've been keeping on doing. And so it's been very special to see um, online villages start. So we've, we've had for the first time a Facebook village, which is something I never thought could be possible. We have our traditional dances, our seva, uh, uh, and, and things which we've been able to do over Zoom. That's the first time I've ever seen our elders and our community do that. Um, but it hasn't all been easy, and, and we all know for um, many of our Indigenous young ones, life can be harder um, due to colonisation and loss of language um, and other things which might help us stay well. So I really appreciated it when a Samoan young woman up here in Auckland, Anga Nga Le Fili Le Puluai, Tupuai, when she, she wrote something, and I just wanted to read a small part of it. Um, our school opened today, spent it watching people swap levers notices for CVs because money is low and mouths got to feed. Remembered every joke about high school dropouts from the mouth of a high decile school kids that didn't work a day of lockdown. It's ironic. Watched our teachers try their best with what they have while richer schools have unused resources locked away in unused labs. It's ironic. When level three came, I watched my friends bury their youth in every graveyard shift. Day after day, they were told they were essential but those laptops never came. So I guess they were at the bottom of the waiting list. It's ironic. And there's much more that she wrote. And I'd encourage everyone to read, read um, what she wrote. But she talked about how for um, during our lockdown here in New Zealand and around the world, many of our indigenous young people ended up being the essential workforce, but aren't treated like essential. You know, our mental health often is the, some of the least valued mental health because of, of many different systemic problems. Um, yeah, and, and, and she talked about how, you know, her school, which was full of Indigenous young people from our region and from New Zealand, weren't given the, the support. Um, and, but there has been some good support too. We're very blessed in our country that the government decided to invest in, in putting our languages on, on the TV and on the radio so that we heard our own messages in our own Indigenous languages. Um, but there's, there's so much more to do. And one challenge I'd have for all countries which have colonised other countries or have colonized indigenous peoples is are you making it easy for indigenous people to be in their place so i, I guess like for, for us here who have our connections in, in the pacific um, new zealand colonized um, cook islands Niue, and tokela and and samoa and other countries is it prioritizing those countries to open the border to first because that's what indigenous manamotuhaki that's what indigenous sovereignty looks like 
but yeah, there's lots that can happen and our young ones are making change, but um, it, it helps having spaces like this too, to, to keep our governments in check, because that's what it's about, bringing multicultural and indigenous voices so that it's not just, um, you know, pale male style, because that is a thing. <laughs> Thanks for asking, Jay. Thank you so much, Josiah. Thank you for sharing your uh, personal experience, but also drawing our attention to some of the root causes of these issues. And, and you, as you very correctly said, the sort of long-standing, deep, um, reflective um, root causes of issues caused by colonization, particularly for indigenous communities. And I, I, I really like the question you posed, and I would like all of us to keep that in our mind throughout this session. Are we making it conducive and are we making it easy for indigenous communities to tackle with this pandemic and, and live peacefully in the in the in the lands that are that were originally theirs? Thank you so much, uh, Josiah, for those reflections. I would like to now introduce Victor Lopez Carmen from the Crow Creek Sioux and Yaki tribes in the US co-chair of the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus and student at Harvard Medical School. Victor, how have you been? How have you been coping with COVID? And what are some of the challenges you have seen in your community when it comes to mental health during the pandemic? Over to you. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much, Diathma. Um, and uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here with all of the Indigenous youth from around the world. It's uh, such an important conversation. Uh, before I talk about myself and my community, I, want, I just wanna give some of the context of this pandemic in a historical sense and mention that over 500 years ago, the Western world arrived on our shores and along with the uh, systemic oppression and trauma that last until today um, and left us in very vulnerable situations, diseases were brought that we didn't have immunity to. So this is not the first time that our communities are facing disproportionate health impacts made much more deadly by policy, social factors, and systemic inequalities outside of our control and against our vision for our communities. And we come to today and these intergenerational traumas having to do with the stories we heard from our grandparents, and the stories they heard from their grandparents, uh, they can strike fear in our communities and in our indigenous youth. Um, our elders in many cases are dying from the pandemic, whether it be through the virus itself, the social inequalities that make it more deadly, uh, the food insecurity that came as a side effect of the shutdowns and the job losses. Um, our elders are being hit and this for us represents a cultural loss uh, because our elders carry our stories, our languages, our traditions that have been hard fought. Uh, many of these have been kept only through the sacrifices of our ancestors having to fight for to retain this knowledge. And then we see this virus coming in that, that it, it can be quite scary to indigenous youth who want to learn their languages and practice their cultures and want to spend time with their grandparents. Um, one of the problems I think is that when indigenous youth are, are fearful, when they're scared, they turn to their grandparents. But in these times, it's much harder because oftentimes with social distancing and communities, it's not possible. But at the same time, where else do they turn to? Well, they'll look into the media. These days, indigenous youth um, in the United States are quite tech savvy but our stories also aren't represented in the media or the data. Um, when it comes to racial and ethnic impacts of COVID-19, we don't see our stories represented. And I think that this can lead to lack of hope that no one's paying attention to our communities. No one's paying attention to us. There's also a lack of robust response from the government. So a lot of our communities have had to shut down our borders. My community had to do that, we got hit. Um, we, and one of the only things we could do because we're in such a vulnerable situation is shut down our borders. Um, but without help from the government and without trust that's been built, I think that also leads to some hopelessness as well. Um, for me personally, you know, going to medical school during this and learning not only about how deadly the virus is, um, but learning about the ways structural inequality 
um, and lack of response from, from governments and countries makes this more deadly and exacerbates this historical oppression has been quite distressing, especially for myself, again, not seeing um, a response from, from society that recognizes that we are dealing with very disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. Um, but like Josiah said, I've seen a lot of hope as well in indigenous communities. We have our ceremonies. Um, a lot of them have been canceled, but we've taken them into our households. We're still praying. Um, they've moved a lot of our um, traditional gatherings online, like powwows, and that's been really powerful. A lot of stories have been shared through Zoom, chances to connect um, with relatives, and uh, a lot of, I think, people taking a lot of responsibility in communities, and our leaders have been very strong in the response um, from my perspective in reassuring our communities that um, we've been through this before, and we're going to get through this again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, for that strong message of resilience. But I, um, I also recall the very strong article you wrote to Teen Vogue uh, during the beginning of the, the pandemic, talking about these same issues. But um, I, I very vividly remember something you wrote about now being a part of the medical sector and being in medical school, how you also see structural racism and, and systems of oppression and how that makes the virus and, and other health issues more deadly towards um, uh, indigenous people. And, and you called for more culturally sensitive, accessible in, in indigenous languages, the information, being better at recruiting indigenous students as, as healthcare workers and experts, and more willingness to put actually money into data and research on um, particular health impacts on, on indigenous populations. So if you haven't read it, I, I also highly uh, encourage reading Victor's op-ed at the Teen Vogue magazine. It was one of the inspiring um, instruments that I read that actually inspired me to convene this gathering, particularly on Indigenous youth together with uh, the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus as well. So thank you, Victor, for holding our feet under fire and please keep being the strong voice you are for Indigenous youth around the world. So from the US, now I'm going across the ocean to Bangladesh, virtually, of course. And I would like to now introduce Ukengching Marma from Bangladesh. She's the eighth Hmong Circle Queen of the Chittagong Hill Tracts and a committed advocate for historically marginalized indigenous communities. Ukengching, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Please tell us a little bit more about how the pandemic has been affecting you and your community. Uh, and feel free to add anything that uh, um, to anything to that Josiah and Victor spoke before as well um, and any particular issues that you have seen in your community and how young people have been dealing with those issues. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jayadma, for giving me the floor and very grateful to all the organizers for this incredible opportunity to discuss one of the most significant and sensible topics during our time. Uh, Jennifer, can I have my slides, please? Uh, so I believe during this pandemic, most of us have been facing issues related to mental health. And as we all agree, different people face different mental burdens depending on what situation or context they belong to. Um, as I echo with Victor, the same thing that there are certain social, economical and political reasons behind it. So I'm from Chittagong Hill Tracks, Bangladesh, which is a post-conflict region and our people have experienced more than two decades of conflict and majority of the indigenous population have gone through a certain type of trauma, PTSD, depression in various points in their lives. So in Chittagong Hill Tracks region, we have 11 indigenous communities and most of the villages are located in rough hilly terrain with limited modern life facilities, limited access to education, health facilities, and half of the indigenous population are still living under poverty line and depend on agriculture. Our indigenous people, especially um, indigenous youths, are the bearer of intergenerational trauma due to decades of oppression and discrimination happening against us. There are also other several challenges, for example, severe food insecurity, widespread unemployment, and poor financial situation in our region. 
And many of us have never discussed about mental health issues or never heard of, you know, like how a mental a person, you know, whenever he or she goes through any sort of trauma or depression, where to go. And just a few days back, I was looking into mental health research and data among the indigenous population from our region. And I literally found zero information in the internet. So there has to be more research and intervention should be done on, um, on this mental health topic among the indigenous population, which should reflect the real picture of our people. Um, Jennifer, yeah, this one. So let's talk a little bit about how our indigenous youths are coping during this pandemic. So since our indigenous people are very much connected to nature and many of the youths were stressing out due to the month of lockdown and shutdown of education and institutions. I have been observing in social media that they are going for a group tour to forest, having indigenous forest food, engaging themselves uh, and educating others in own mother tongue, which are giving them such a comfort and relaxation during this pandemic time. And it's very saddening for us that in our generation, many of the indigenous youths like us, we cannot read and write in our own mother tongue because all our lives we have been studying a national Bengali language and have been trying to learn English for adapting to globalization. And another most common challenge our indigenous youths are facing is lack of job opportunities, especially who are fresh graduates. And they are missing many required skills. For example, um, you know, the uh, required, required or competent skills to fight for a decent job against majority population. There are some other reasons as well. Financial instability, lack of access to quality education and health facilities are resulting into longer term mental health burdens, which existed in our community before. And this COVID-19 pandemic just added additional burdens among the indigenous youths. And most of the time in our society, people associate with different misconceptions and prejudices while someone go and seek for professional and mental health support. And also there are very limited facilities for seeking psychosocial support when anyone goes through any sort of depression and trauma. Uh, lastly, uh, Jennifer, last slide. <laughs> Yeah. So lastly, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, that UNICEF is one of the long, long standing partners with government of Bangladesh working in Chittagong Hill Tracks and have been integrating community development projects that focus on maternal and child or nutrition and water sanitation in our region. And they have more than 5,000 village concentrated centers in Chittagong Hill Tracks, which we call para centers. And in those para centers, they have a special package for caregiver or on mental health support or peer to peer support system. Um, and at the end, I believe UNICEF's projects are very much significant and influential to fight mental health burdens in current or longer term situation. Because children are our futures and mothers are the role players to build a nation and we can certainly expect an, edu an educated indigenous generation in next 10 or 20 years with required skills who can fight for their rights and also overcome mental health burdens in Chittagong Hill Tracks. That's it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ukenshin, for that very informative presentation. Also really great to see the work that you're doing in your community along with other young people to make sure that not only yourself, but your peers are also taken care of. I would now like to introduce Joan Tumoki Lekukshula from the Samburu community in Kenya. Joan is a program officer for the New Dawn Pace Setter, an NGO working with indigenous communities in Kenya. John, please share with us how you and your community have been coping under the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm an indigenous youth from the Northern Kenya, from a tribe called uh, Samburu. And actually uh, in Samburu community, we have, uh, we have been we have gone through so many challenges in relation to mental health and actually also from the COVID-19 pandemic that has just uh, come into our midst. And first of all, uh, in our community, we believe, in, we believe that 
if someone has a mental health issue, it is something that uh, has been maybe caused by a curse from the ancestors. And that's actually, it is a belief that it, it has been inherited from a ancestral point of view. We also believe that if someone has a mental health or someone is not uh, okay, we say that that person has been bewitched. And actually, it has caused a lot of problems because now if someone has just been affected by a mental health issue, that person is tied or put in isolation in, the, in, a, in a homestead because uh, that person should not be, should not interact with other people. And actually it is uh, connected with the disability issue because if, if, you are, if someone is disabled or a child has a, let's say a disease called a, a, a plesi, a, a plesi or something of that sort, that child is isolated. And actually we have now come to realize that many children who, are, who have uh, mental health issues connected to disability, they are put in isolation because uh, the community itself is not uh, believing that there's, there's a mental issue. It is something that is witchcraft or something or a curse from that family. So you find many, many children are dying in isolation or in silence because it is not being discussed or it is not coming out clearly that this child has a mental health issue or this youth or this person in this community has a mental health issue. And actually, we know when you are when you are youth, you you are somehow you depend on parents, and if you don't have that capacity of, to take yourself to the hospital, then you will die in isolation. So, uh, as a program officer in a organization called a Peseta, the New Dawn Peseta, we have actually streamlined our programs to at least be universal. You find that you mostly deal with uh, girl issues and women uh, challenges because of the uh, uh, patriarch system in our society whereby women are not given a chance to talk uh, on, on their voices. They are not saying. John, do we still have you? I think we are having some connectivity issues with John. So let me go to our next speaker and perhaps I can come back to uh, John when he's back. Um, and our teams will be working backstage to make sure that we can connect John soon again. With that, I would like to introduce Yupta Itowaki from Suriname. Yupta is the chairperson of the Mulokot Foundation, which supports the Vayana indigenous tribe in Suriname. Yupta, thank you for joining us. I really look forward to hearing your story of how you and your community have been coping with COVID. Over to you. All right, good morning, Taraipo Kamanato, Uwa Yupta. Greetings to you and thank you for um, for this honor. Um, let me tell you a bit about my community. I am from the Northern Amazon region. Um, the Wayana live in Brazil, Suriname, and in French Guyana. Um, uh, Suriname is a country in South America. Um, let me see if I can, yeah. Um, Jen, can, I, can we have my slide, please? My PowerPoint. Thank you. So, um, before um, um, Corona with this pandemic, we already had some issues um, in the community because of the of the influence of the Western world um, in our community, but also um, access to to internet, um, where where the youth um, has access to see how 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 a wonderful world it is on social media and things like that. Um, we also had troubles with um, people coping with al alcohol abuse and. And because of these things, um, we had a very high rate of suicide and also sexual harassment and domestic violence um, within the Wayana community. 
And some of the reasons are that um, we think um, is that the youth that the youth are having an identity crisis because um, the Western world has an accept has an accept um, ex yeah acceptation of them how they should be, but the indigenous community also wants them to be indigenous. So they are actually having an identity crisis. What should I be? Who should I be? Um, as I was already mentioning, the influence of the church and the Western world is also um, putting pressure on on the youth because. Um, I will tell you a little bit about what my grandmother believes, why there's so much um, um, issues or problems going on with, with the youth um, um, right now. She believes that um, because our um, relationship is damaged with the spiritual world and um, that's why there is so much problems right now. So um, we are trying to see how we can um, try to try to bring back the our identity how can we make the indigenous youth proud again and so so that they can make the connection again because we believe that um, um, being in harmony with nature and um, being um, having a good relationship will make things good again um, one of the audiences that we that we believe that um, the youth concern about their future. Um, we, my community, is in a gold mining, um, uh, go in the middle of gold mining. So the threat that the gold miners also um, poses is that um, that the, that we are not that the youth think that they don't have a, a very brightful future anymore because of the because uh, of the pollution and everything like that. So you want to be one with nature, but you can't because the um, nature, the environment is also um, damaged because for mental health, when you want to relax, when there is a lot of stress, you want to go back to nature, you want to go back to the land. And if is if also our environment, but our lands is threatened and um, is is destroyed, then for us, there is no way to go back to, to the land, to be one with land, with the land. Um, now with this pandemic, um, the Wayana community had to, had to get used to the new uh, the new normal um, with the um, the lockdown and everything to stay home, um, not go in crowded areas and things like that. So with all of what was going on already, it had a lot of pressure on our youth, and we were thinking of ways how we can how we can um, um, find solutions, but also um, activities to, 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 um, to get the pressure off a little bit. So um, last year, we started a project in our community on how can we find solutions or how, how can we um, get the pressure off um, in the Wayana community in South Suriname. And um, it's been going on really great. We've also done um, trainings uh, of of young women and and some and young men to see how they can help and guide um, victims um, of of violence, but also of uh, mental health, of alcohol abuse, and things like that. Um, this is one of the actions that we're also doing, sharing our experiences, um, but all. Um, um, learning good practices from other um, communities to how they cope um, with mental health um, among their uh, among their youth. So um, this is something that we are doing right now, and we have really great ideas to uh, also have um, doing something with art because that is also one thing. If you cannot go back to the land, let's see if we can get back some cultural aspects um, in the form of art so that um, they are able to express themselves. So these are some of the things that we are doing in our community. Thank you, Ipong Manai. Thank you very much, uh, Yukta, for sharing those very useful insights, both about the issues and the solutions from your community. We're so grateful 
that you could join us today. Uh, thank you all to, also to Victor, U Uken Ching, Josiah, um, and John for their thoughts uh, and powerful remarks and reflections as well. Unfortunately, we lost John halfway into his intervention, but I really hope we can get him back. But if not, this is also a really good reflection. Actually, and, I'm, back. I'm back. Oh, he, he is. Great. Thank Sorry. you, John. Uh, thank you. No, don't need to apologize. It wasn't your fault. And, you know, you have uh, now won the battle against technology as well. So welcome back. And please, uh, you were in the middle of your intervention when we lost you. Go ahead and share your reflections. Yeah, actually, sorry, sorry, actually. I'm in a northern Kenya where network is an issue. So actually, we depend on waves. So it moves and uh, it goes on and off. So sorry for that. Sorry, sorry. So actually, uh, as an indigenous youth in Kenya, uh, actually, youth are undergoing a lot of problems, actually, in the middle of this uh, pandemic. Uh, actually, many youths have lost jobs because uh, most of them uh, depends on market. We do livestock marketing because uh, actually livestock keeping is our main uh, economic activity and that's, uh, that's our livelihood. So actually, we do livestock market. So when, when markets are closed because of the pandemic, now that uh, because of this issue of government is saying that we need to have social distance. So there's no way you can conduct the market because it's uh, something that, like, you, you, we do, uh, it's something like an agreement between one and one, two, three people. So you can't do livestock marketing amid this uh, pandemic. So markets are closed and the youths are now at homes. We are many cases now are rising because of the unemployment and the gender-based violence are at homes now. Even uh, some cases, are, uh, if you find someone is uh, committing suicide because of, like you don't have something to feed your family and you are the very winner of that family. So uh, mental health challenges um, are coming up because of the pandemic. So because of that, uh, as a program officer from the PESETA, we have now enrolled programs so, to sensitize community, our communities on how we can cope with the COVID-19 as well as uh, mitigate uh, challenges related to mental health. And that's where now you find that we are doing a community sensitization on uh, how, can, how, how can our community reduce the cases of uh, young girls being uh, married of we call it early marriages. Early marriages are rampant because of, uh, you know, the community believe that uh, a child or a girl is uh, is a wealth source of wealth. So you give out the, the, the girl to as a bride, and then also you get uh, you get dowry, and that's what uh, our community term it as a wealth. So we find that we have so many cases of girl, early child marriages now. And we actually enrolling programs on how we engage the local leaders to at least to mitigate this uh, menace. And also, pregnancies are rampant because of the because of the because of the setup, the community living. So we are actually engaging lo local leaders so that we can reduce this because now many girls are at home because of the schools are closed and the mental health challenges are coming up to be so many. And with that, uh, that's all I have for, for today. And uh, I'm saying thank you and sorry for just the- Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much, John. And thank you also for highlighting the importance of the gender lens in your work and, and in your community, the importance of empowering young women and girls and protecting and safeguarding their rights, um, which often tends to be forgotten when we talk generally about youth in our community. So thank you so much for um, your work and, and trying to empower your peers and your sisters um, in, in your community. So with that, we will go to our next Next segment, which is also very exciting, we will now see a video message from the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus on how its members around the world have been keeping safe and taking care of themselves and others during the pandemic.
kama vijana kutoka jamii asili virusi vya corona ama covid 19 vinaonekana kuwa hatari kubwa sana Young people are not immune. We can carry the barriers and the lives of all elders are the risk. Wankanki na tankanki, at kia wo unkie, we chu you happy. Hana wo lokota, you ha upi. O we cha kia, unku pikta na iha we chung tapi. We help our elders by running their errands for them and picking up necessities so that they can avoid crowded spaces. Um, we chop their wood, leave seeds for them to plant, um, as well as asking them to share stories either over the phone or from afar. We find creative ways to support them while protecting them from exposure. Tomorrow, we have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of Amamta te votam. Beweta te ka amamta nam. Bewe ituk in yowe te yore. Para reducir nuestra exposición al virus y también así dejar de regarlo, preferimos quedarnos en casa con nuestras familias, evitamos viajes innecesarios y evitamos las áreas públicas también. Be all and overcome us, because together, if we each do our part, we will get through this and we will remain strong. What a beautiful message. What a powerful message. Thank you so much for getting together as a community in these trying times and, and giving us uh, advice, but also messages of hope and, um, and, and really making us look forward to a, a brighter future. Now we turn to our indigenous rights and healthcare professionals to answer the burning questions that you have sent us ahead of this session on indigenous youth and mental health. I would first like to introduce Dr. Gunjan Donju, a child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Kanti Children's Hospital in Nepal. Dr. Gunjan, thank you very much for joining us today. A question we have received repeatedly is, how can we best approach the challenge of ensuring mental health services that are culturally safe for indigenous peoples across the world? Please share us uh, the answer to this question with your experience. Over to you, Dr. Gunjan. Uh, thank you so much, Jaya, for the question. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Gunjan Doju. I'm from Nepal. Uh, just to give a brief background, Nepal uh, is a country in Southeast Asia with around 30 million population at present, and 35% of the population is indigenous group. Uh, and it consists of uh, 126 castes and ethnic groups, and over more than 100 languages are spoken. So uh, I myself am from an indigenous group called the Newars, uh, which is uh, um, um, mostly uh, the people in the capital city uh, at, at present. So uh, coming to that uh, question about how to make uh, mental health uh, services more friendly towards all these cultures uh, of the indigenous group is like, we need to uh, first of all understand that uh, the indigenous group come from different kinds of social cultural backgrounds. And uh, they have varying concepts about uh, well-being and health and uh, stress, illnesses, and they have their own ways of coping. And similar to that, there are also a lot of superstitions that are associated with it. Like uh, it, uh, some consider it a, it a curse, some say it's black magic, witchcraft, sins of the past. And there's also a lot of stigma associated with either mental illnesses or disabilities uh, and the other associated things. Uh, and many of them actually visit the faith healers. They might be the first person who they go into contact uh, for mental health related issues. So there's a huge gap between what is actually needed and uh, what the services are uh, available. Like you may set up a clinic, but then if people do not know that it's a mental health issue, uh, but then they think that it's uh, because of some curse, 
uh, then uh, it might it might be an issue. So uh, there's a there's a huge gap which needs to be addressed. And what I feel is like uh, from the time that we design the mental health services, uh, we need to incorporate uh, the mental health services into the existing social and family systems and that are present in the indigenous groups. We also need to engage the indigenous groups and youths uh, from the point of the very conceptualization of those projects from designs and implementations. Uh, so these are, I think, factors that we really need to consider. Uh, at present, uh, we are working with uh, a community, uh, child and adults in mental health uh, care package with UNICEF in Nepal. Uh, we have also recently started a COVID-19 related child and adults in mental health uh, issues related project with UNICEF uh, just recently. And in both of these uh, projects, like when we uh, developed the program framework, we had to consider the, uh, the, the cultural adaptation parts so that uh, when we take a particular framework, we have enough variables that are flexible enough to allow the adaptability so that it fits the needs of these indigenous groups. And then we empower them and then we engage them as much as possible from the very beginning. So I think when we uh, take this kind of approach, it would probably uh, you know, encourage the youths from the indigenous groups to uh, pursue mental health uh, in the form of studies uh, for themselves later and also to work in this field in the future. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you, Dr. Gunjan. I would now like to introduce Mr. Jeffrey Roth, an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Thank you, Jeffrey, for joining us today. Indigenous people often live in remote places and speak only their languages. One of the questions we have received is, how can we make mental health services accessible in these contexts? Jeffrey, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well, go ahead. Great, uh, you know, th thank you for the question. And, uh, you know, I I'd first like to thank you and uh, the staff of the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth and the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, uh, UNICEF and the WHO for, for hosting this, this really important event about our indigenous youth and, and wellness. Um, in general, the answers to youth mental health and wellness are within our indigenous communities. And, you know, I think we've heard that uh, already from our, uh, our youth that have spoke before. And so I'm so proud of, uh, of what we heard before and, and all the answers that we heard before. They, they covered everything that I wanted to cover, actually. I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, you know, when we turn to our communities, we see the best outcomes uh, for our youth. I think it's important to take a, a system of care approach by building on the strengths and resources and making the strategies very local. Uh, everyone in our community has a role. And I wanna talk just a little bit about that approach and, and, how to, and how to move forward in the systems of care approach. The first step in any community is to start with an assessment, uh, which includes the identification of natural helpers to assist in planning and implementing strategies that will work. Um, training is invested into these natural helpers, such as mental health first aid, gatekeeper training and trauma-informed care training. These natural helpers are the peers, the aunties, the uncles, the grandmas, the grandpas in our community that naturally help others. The Western world certifies these people as peer support providers or recovery support professionals, um, but it's better to use names that make sense in our indigenous communities and natural helpers seems to make the most sense. Um, we've seen many of these natural helpers continue higher education and are serving as professional roles now um, they're no longer natural helpers, but they're the local indigenous professionals that are providing mental health services. This approach is about building multiple training pathways to show good interest and skills as an, uh, for individuals that are showing good interest and skills as an important strategy for workforce development in our communities. It's also important uh, to ensure that there are strong linkages between our spiritual community and our, and our family and that there is support for wraparound models in our, to train our community in care coordination and working as part of a care team, uh, ensuring that linkages to mental health providers are also very strong. Mental, mental health providers can be coaches uh, if they're present in the communities, and I, I think you made reference to that, uh, to these natural helpers and help them navigate uh, certain situations and consider the best responses. It's also important that the training and the models be inclusive of local cultural beliefs and worldviews. 
you must tailor to the local culture. It's not effective when you try and apply a Western approach. And I think you've heard that again and again uh, today. So uh, as you are creating a system of care team approach that values, it values the expertise of the local people to help themselves. The system of care approach is all about coordination of linkages of services and support. So this is about creating policy and process and uh, meeting comprehensive needs expressed by the voices of the local youth and, and families. Um, these natural helpers are a perfect central point for helping to pull all of these pieces together um, uh, and shape the policy and practice and training and evaluation because they tend to be in the know and, and more experts in the local um, community. I, I just wanna make one more point that I think you were trying to make earlier about internet access and uh, how important it is, especially now you know, linkages to peers and natural helpers or mental health professionals, professionals is absolutely vital and it is occurring uh, virtually, but we need greater connectivity uh, globally uh, for our uh, indigenous communities. And that's something that we need to work on. So thanks again for the question. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, also raising the issue of connectivity. I was going to raise it, but then we got John back, but it was a really good example of um, the challenges, but also the resilience that indigenous youth have when it comes to really tackling these issues. But thank you for calling our attention to these very important issues. Now, I want to introduce Alec Kalak, member of the Pauma Band of Luisinio Indians, one of the 574 federally recognized tribal nations in the United States and currently a medical student at the University of California, San Diego. Alec, thank you so much for joining us. The question from young people that we have received to you is, what will need to happen to create more opportunities for indigenous youth to study and become mental health providers? Over to you, Alec. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, Miu Yam, uh, hello everyone. Um, I think we've heard you know, so much from our speakers and again, kind of covered what I wanted to cover, but um, you know, it's, it's an honor to kind of share my student perspective, um, especially at this time. Um, you know, so I think in reflection, COVID-19 has revealed to the world what indigenous people have known for centuries. You know, we are not viewed as equals. We do not have equitable and safe access to healthcare and we certainly do not have the same educational opportunities. Um, you know, as Victor kind of touched on, as our youth are increasingly isolated and unable to gather, the pandemic has also highlighted a need for more indigenous mental health providers. And I think as a student leader, um, you know, we'll meet this need by first calling on academic medical institutions to increase their enrollment of indigenous students. We live at a time when 40% of US medical schools have no enrolled native medical students and another 50% have no more than three students. We know that these feelings of isolation and lack of mentorship by indigenous faculty contribute to the low retention and graduation rates that we see for indigenous students. Um, second, um, creating experiential learning opportunities for indigenous students. There are over 30 tribal colleges and universities in the US and only two of them offer bachelor's degrees in STEM disciplines. Um, and finally, providing capacity building grants to indigenous communities to train their own mental health providers. The United States Congress has sat on two critical pieces of legislation um, sponsored by Representative Raul Ruiz from California, the Native Health Access Improvement Act and Native Health and Wellness Act for almost three years. These bills invest in tribal communities and create a special behavioral health program, as well as a health professions recruitment program for indigenous youth. So this is really a time when we need action and indigenous people and organizations have put forward the solutions and now we need to act on those solutions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Thank you also uh, for sharing those very stark numbers. And I think we need to be raising these um, more and more to get the attention of those who are in power so that Indigenous youth can have equal access to education and, and the services that they need to empower themselves and to realize their fullest potential. Thank you again to Alec and to Jeffrey and Dr. Gunjan as well. We truly appreciate you being with us here today and sharing with us your expertise. We have now come to 
to the end of our prayer, uh, end of our Q and A session, and also our webinar. But before we part today, uh, I want to invite John back, our resilient John, to take us through a closing prayer. John, the floor is yours. John, did we lose you again? Ah, there you are. Uh, sure. Okay, I'm back, I'm back. Uh, Can you hear us, John? Yeah, I'm there. So now we are closing with a traditional prayer. And actually, you know, for me, in our community, actually, uh, a traditional prayer, you can either respond by saying okay, or uh, you can uh, just be silent and uh, believe that uh, you are conversing with God. So now we start. So, I am going to say that 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 I am the New Zealand, the Kenya, the Nepal, the US, the UN, WHO, UNICEF, the Yeah, that is it. Thank you so much, John. Um, thank you for your time. To all our amazing speakers, to our, all of our weavers, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for also bringing light to the issues that are facing uh, young indigenous people. I can commit to, as the youth envoy to keep uh, this conversation going and to be sure that we include your voices in the most important conversations that we have here at the UN. Big thank you to our partners, Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, Harvard Medical Students Association, Student Response Team to COVID-19, and also UNICEF and WHO. Um, with that, we wrap up. Please stay safe, everyone. Stay healthy and stay connected. See you soon. <laughs>